red black trees are an incredibly useful, practical, and common data structure. In fact, you will find them in the Linux kernel. You will find them in the C++ standard template library. You'll find them in Java's own tree map implementation. And we love them here in 3110. They're even a part of the 3110 shield. You can see this tree with some red and some black nodes in it. Of course, the other two pieces of that shield are lists and functions, which transform inputs into outputs. Red black trees were invented back in 1978. I'm going to be teaching you a functional version of them that was invented by Okasaki in 1998. In a red black tree, first off, you have a binary search tree. But in addition to that, every node is colored, either red or black. Why those two colors? It vexes me because I happen to be red green colorblind. I don't see red very well at all. It mostly just looks gray to me. I'm told those were the colors they chose originally because they had a color printer back then, and those were the two best colors they could print on that particular color printer. These days, we're kind of stuck with it. The red black tree, by convention, has leaves and roots that are always colored black. So it's just some nodes in between there that could end up being colored red. The rep invariant for a red black tree is one of the most important things to know about it. First off, the rep invariant requires that the tree is a BST. So the BST invariant is part of the red black invariant. Then there's two other pieces. The first I'll call the local invariant. The local invariant for a red black tree says that no red node has a red child. So you never get two reds in a row. I call that local because you can check it locally at each node. Look at a node and then just look at its children. Of course, you'd have to do that for all the nodes, but it's still something you can check locally at the node. The global invariant, though, is something that is not so easy to check. The global invariant says that every path from the root to a leaf has the same number of black nodes. So if one path from the root to a leaf has five black nodes, then all of them have to have five black nodes. Now, that doesn't mean all the paths have the same length. Some of them could have some reds interspersed in between, but they've all got to have the same number of black. This, by the way, is a good example of a time where we don't want to check an entire precondition or assert the precondition on entry to a function. Because every red black tree operation is going to have this rep invariant implicitly as a precondition. And checking these invariants actually requires looking at every node in the tree. So that would automatically cause every operation to become at least linear time, if not worse if we were to assert the precondition. Let's look at some examples. Here's a candidate for a red black tree, but it fails the rep invariant because the global invariant is broken. On the path going down the left of the tree, we've got two black nodes and implicitly some black leaves below that black node, but we're mostly not gonna think about leaves. We don't even draw them. On the right path down through the tree, we only have one black node. So the black lengths of those paths are not the same. That violates the global invariant. Here's another tree. This one violates the local invariant because this tree has two red nodes in a row. Two and one are both colored red. You're not allowed to do that in a red black tree. Here is a valid red black tree. The black length of all paths is the same. There's two black nodes on every path, or if you count the leaves, three. And we don't have any two red nodes in a row. Now it's fine that the length of some paths differs. We have some paths in this tree that have length two, some that have length one, that's okay. It's also fine that we don't have the same number of red nodes in every path. 
That's not a part of any invariant. And it's fine that we have a couple black nodes in a row on a path. What about those path lengths? It's a lemma that we could prove that the length of the longest path in a red-black tree is at most twice the length of the shortest path. You can get some intuition for why that would be true by thinking about any path that has only black nodes. So suppose there's a path in the tree that has four black nodes, and it's only those nodes on that path. Well, by the global invariant, Every other path in that tree must have four black nodes. So how could you make the paths longer? Well, you could insert some red nodes along some paths, but maybe not others. Where can you insert those red nodes? Well, we said by convention the root would be black, so you can't insert it at the root. And we said that you could never have two red nodes in a row. That's the local invariant. So the most you could ever insert is one red node between each pair of black nodes on a path. So that would expand that path of length three between four black nodes to be length six. This is how red-black trees achieve logarithmic performance. In fact, it's a theorem that the maximum depth of a node in a red-black tree of size n is at most two times the floor of log n plus one, where we're taking the log base two. So since big O lets us ignore constant factors, we get to ignore that too. It doesn't really matter. That means all of our operations are going to run in logarithmic time in the size of the tree. Isn't that great? We get logarithmic performance by enforcing those red-black invariants. That means red-black trees are balanced, and all the operations generally run in logarithmic time.